on World News Tonight. Not guilty. Former US President Donald Trump pleads not guilty to election charges in the latest arrangement. Deadly crash. A bus carrying migrants plunges down a ravine in Mexico, killing dozens and injuring others. Hiked again. The Bank of England raises interest rates for the 14th time in efforts to contain the rising inflation. Woven from waste. Nigerian artists upscale used cans by weaving them into portraits. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are watching World News. We begin tonight as former US President Donald Trump stumbles upon more legal trouble. Trump has once again pleaded not guilty to charges that he conspired to overturn his 2020 presidential election defeat. Upon his not guilty plea, Trump expressed his discontent, calling the move a political persecution. This is a very sad day for America. Former President Donald Trump called the latest indictment against him a persecution on Thursday after his arraignment on federal charges he led a conspiracy built on lies to overturn his 2020 election defeat. Inside the Washington, D.C. courtroom about an hour earlier, Trump pleaded not guilty to the charges, standing up to address the judge directly as he entered the plea. Sitting in the front row behind Trump was special counsel Jack Smith, Trump appeared to glance occasionally at Smith, who has accused the former president and his allies of promoting false claims that the election was rigged, pressuring state and federal officials to alter the results, and assembling fake slates of electors to try to wrest electoral votes from then-president-elect Joe Biden. Outside, small groups of Trump supporters and critics took turns posing in front of the John Marshall Park entrance of the federal courthouse, about a half mile from the U.S. Capitol, the building Trump's supporters attacked on January 6, 2021. The men and women of law enforcement who defended the U.S. Capitol on January 6 are heroes. On Tuesday, Smith announced the four felony charges, including conspiracy to defraud the United States, to deprive citizens of their voting rights, and to obstruct an official proceeding. The most serious charge carries a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. Thursday's arraignment was the third time Trump has pleaded not guilty since April. The 77-year-old and front-runner for the Republican presidential nomination previously pleaded not guilty to federal charges that he retained classified documents after leaving office and New York state charges that he falsified documents in connection with hush money payments to a porn star. And he may soon face more charges in Georgia, where a state prosecutor is investigating his attempts to overturn the 2020 election there. This is a persecution of a political opponent. While Trump repeated his claim that he was being persecuted before flying back to his Bedminster, New Jersey golf club, Trump himself has been accused of using government power for political gain. His first of two impeachments in 2019 was for pressuring Ukraine to investigate his Democratic rival Joe Biden before the 2020 election. Senate Republicans later acquitted him of those charges. This is not the place that I left. Trump also said that he was sad to see what he called filth and broken buildings in Washington, D.C. When he left office, the city was barricaded and occupied by thousands of National Guard troops after his supporters broke into the Capitol in a failed attempt to stop Congress from certifying his election loss. Now, at least 18 people are feared to have been killed and 21 others were injured in a bus crash in the coastal Mexican state of Nayarit. The crash happened near Barranca Blanca on the highway outside the state capital, Tepic. Rescuers climbed down to retrieve bodies stuck in the mangled remains of a bus that veered off a highway in Mexico and plunged 130 feet deep into a ravine. The accident on Thursday on a highway near Barranca Blanca claimed the lives of more than a dozen people. The death toll reported by authorities in the western Mexican state of Nayarit has climbed several times. En route to the northern border town of Tijuana, the bus had been carrying around 42 passengers, including citizens from India, Dominican Republic and African nations. State officials say the passengers were mostly foreigners and some were heading to the U.S. border. The bus driver was detained and was suspected of speeding round a bend in the road. Bus crashes on highways are common in Mexico due to winding steep roads in remote parts of the country. 
Last month, a bus crash in the southern state of Oaxaca left 29 people dead. And in February, a bus carrying migrants from South and Central America crashed in central Mexico, killing 17. And now over in the UK, arrests have been made following the Greenpeace protest that targeted PM Rishi Sunak's North Yorkshire mansion. Five people have been arrested after they climbed on the roof of the Prime Minister's home to protest at 100 new North Sea oil and gas licenses. Even in an era of high-profile climate protests, it is perhaps the most audacious yet. This time Greenpeace, scaling the Prime Minister's own home, and unrolling their views of his backing for more drilling for oil and gas in the North Sea. We don't take actions lightly. We plan meticulously. Our activists are very well trained. But at the end of the day, it was the Prime Minister who stood up in Scotland this week as the world is burning and said he wants to max out North Sea oil and gas. That was his personal decision. And millions of people around this country, hundreds of millions of people around the world, are going to directly feel the impact of that in very, very personal ways. So there they sat. The Prime Minister wasn't at his constituency home while this was going on. It was left to his deputy visiting a wind farm plant to condemn the protest. Can you stop the stupid stunts? Actually, what they want to see from government is action. That's what you're seeing here today, the world's largest offshore wind farm being built right here, creating jobs. But at the same time, we're going to need, in the coming decades, uh, oil and gas as part of our energy mix. After six hours on the roof and their message clearly delivered, the protesters packed up and began the slow process of getting themselves and their equipment down. Waiting for them, police, an arrest on suspicion of causing criminal damage and public nuisance. I think we could see others actually copying it, maybe not in the same elaborate way, but feeling that the homes of MPs are targets. And I'm afraid that we've seen too much in the past, for example, um, you know, the attacks on MPs like Joe Cox uh, and others, uh, which are really serious. So these things have to be taken seriously. But it seems they're determined to continue. The Prime Minister says he is committed to reaching net zero, but in a proportionate and pragmatic way. That clearly isn't enough for some, and the debate is now very close to home. Also in related news, a presidential call has been issued for all-out efforts to support scouts partaking in the global rally in South Korea, where reports of heat-related incidents have been rampant. With nearly 1,000 teenagers at the World Scouts Jamboree being struck down by heat-related illnesses, South Korea's Prime Minister has led an emergency cabinet meeting to discuss contingency measures against the heat wave. At the meeting which took place on Friday morning, he highlighted the importance of responding as quickly as possible despite the unexpectedness of the situation, and reiterated President Yoon Suk-yeol's instructions. The president has instructed that the scouts should be provided with as many air-conditioned buses and cold water supplies as needed, and that the quality and amount of food provided should be improved immediately. All efforts should be taken by all government ministries to fix these on-site issues. The meeting discussed how the government's newly announced funds to tackle heatwave-related issues across the country should be spent, with half the 4.6 million US dollar budget to be used on providing additional cooling facilities, emergency supplies and air-conditioned shuttle buses at the World Scout Jamboree. The Minister of Health and Welfare also visited the temporary hospital set up at the Jamboree to evaluate the situation and listen to the medical staff's concerns as well as taking note of what additional supports they might need. Earlier this morning, the government and the ruling People Power Party declared that plans were underway to provide enough ice water for 100,000 people on site, as well as providing cooling tents and expanding electricity supply capacity. It will also be explaining these plans to foreign media outlets and diplomats from participating countries, while also remaining well aware of the concerns of the scouts' parents at home. The Defence Ministry has already sent out around a dozen personnel for medical support, but plans to dispatch 30 more later today, as well as setting up shelters and shower facilities for the scouts. 36 ambulances will be on standby during the hottest hours of the day between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. With the event being a global one with participants from 158 countries, countries with participating scout delegations are also closely following the situation.
The UK contingent is the largest, with 4,500 scouts out of the total 43,000 participants. And a Foreign Office correspondent said it was in communication with both Scouts UK and Korean authorities to ensure the safety of British nationals. A tragic discovery has been made as human remains have been found as part of the search for the Australian Army helicopter that crashed off Queensland's Whitsunday Islands. The Australian Defence Force confirmed that further debris had been located, including the helicopter's cockpit, about 40 metres underwater. After days of searching with all available military resources, a grim but important breakthrough. Ongoing search and recovery operations have recovered a range of aircraft debris and major sections of the fuselage. Confirmation, pieces of the Taipan's cockpit and human remains were found yesterday, five days after the crash. Army has spoken with the families of the missing soldiers and is providing them with support. The wreckage and remains have been located at a depth of 40 metres by underwater remotely controlled devices. The search teams have been looking in the area south of Hamilton Island, where they're being supported by the HMAS Huon. The debris field is consistent with a catastrophic high impact. On board were Captain Lyon, Lieutenant Nugent, Warrant Officer Class 2 Laycock and Corporal Nags. While we continue with the recovery as best we can, Poor weather conditions have continued to impact our search efforts. The weather is respected to remain challenging until mid next week. The ADF says it's committed to searching for several weeks if necessary. Tonight, multiple grounded Taipans remain at the nearby Whitsunday Airport as investigations into the crash continue. Specialists are already combing through other significant parts of wreckage found on Saturday. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now the chaos accelerates in Niger as hundreds of supporters of Niger's junta marched in the capital Niamey to protest against West African sanctions as regional defense chiefs discuss possible intervention to restore democracy. These are supporters of Niger's junta. Hundreds of them crowded the capital of Niamey on Thursday, cheering for the military and protesting against West African sanctions. The people in Niger are free today, says this woman, a day she said she never saw coming. Others decried the sanctions imposed by the Economic Community of West African State, or ECOAS. They were announced after President Mohamed Bazoum was overthrown last week. General Abdouhamane Chiani, the former head of Niger's presidential guard, has since declared himself head of state. Regional defense chiefs are in talks about a possible intervention to restore democracy. This is the seventh coup in West and Central Africa since 2020 and follows recent military takeovers in Mali, Burkina Faso and Guinea. ECOA said coups will no longer be tolerated in the region adding it could authorize the use of force if soldiers did not restore Bazoum to power by Sunday. Chani cited persistent insecurity as justification last week, as an Islamist insurgency continues to rage in the region. But an analysis of data shows that security was actually improving, thanks to tactics used by Bazoum's government and help from French and U.S. forces. Violent incidents in Niger were down nearly 40% in the first half of 2023, compared to last year. That's according to the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, a U.S.-based crisis monitoring group. Coups, on the other hand, have seemed to stoke insecurity. ACLED data showed violence has soared in Mali and Burkina Faso since their militaries took power. Last year, deaths in Mali linked to violent incidents doubled to nearly 5,000. In Burkina Faso, they rose 80% to more than 4,000. Security analysts warned that the situation could allow groups linked to Al-Qaeda and Islamic State to expand their reach across the region.
And on tonight's Road to the White House, we bring you the latest updates on the long-shot Republican candidates who inject millions of dollars to their own campaigns. As Vivek Ramaswamy and Doug Burnham have qualified for the GOP debate after each contributed over 10 million US dollars to their own campaigns. Burgum has twice donated to himself, once in March and again in June, a couple of weeks after he announced his candidacy. First time politician Ramaswamy has loaned himself about 15 million US dollars, just around 3.2 million, about 17% of the 19.1 million his campaign has raised as of June came from donors other than himself. Both Ramaswamy and Bergam resorted to offering donors cash incentives in order to meet the threshold and secure their spots on the debate stage, whereas reports show that Donald Trump spent 66 million US dollars on his first campaign when he announced his candidacy. Analysts are predicting that 2024 Republican primary will cost more than 1 billion US dollars. And early projections show this election cycle could be the most expensive yet, breaking the record set in 2020. Now moving on to the UK, Bank of England interest rates went up for the 14th time in a row to 5.25%, meaning more pain for mortgage holders across the country. Bank of England raised its key interest rate by a quarter of a percentage point on Thursday to a 15-year peak of 5.25%. It gave a new warning that borrowing costs were likely to stay high for some time. In contrast to the US Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank, which also raised rates last week. It did not suggest hikes were about to end as it battles high inflation. High inflation hurts the least well off the most. This was the bank's governor, Andrew Bailey. We expect inflation to take a further step down in the July data, which will be published in two weeks' time. We think that will come down to around 7% at that point, followed by another larger step down in October's data, which will be published in November, to around about 5% on that basis. The Bank of England forecast inflation would fall to 4.9% by the end of this year, a faster decline than it had predicted in May. That would be a relief for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who pledged in January to halve inflation this year, a goal which had looked challenging. Bailey said it was too soon to speculate about whether rates had peaked and when they might be cut again. Sterling briefly dipped after the data, and financial markets moved to price in a roughly two-thirds chance of another quarter-point interest rate rise to 5.5% in September. Bailey said the pace of pay growth was above the BOE's previous forecasts, which suggested it would take longer for the knock-on effects of high inflation to fade than it did for them to appear. British inflation hit a 41-year high last year and has fallen more slowly than elsewhere. In June, it stood at 7.9% the highest of any major economy. Now on to the historic labor strike in Hollywood. Warner Brothers Discovery has warned that uncertainty over the dual strikes by Hollywood writers and actors could impact the timing of its film slate and its ability to produce and deliver content. Dual strikes by Hollywood actors and writers are taking their toll on major studios. The strikes have disrupted most fall TV production and halted work on films as workers battle over pay in the streaming era. Toymaker Hasbro announced Thursday that it would sell its E1 film and TV studio to Lionsgate Entertainment by the end of the year. By doing so, Hasbro is, quote, dodging a bullet in terms of the content pipeline, one media expert told. And Warner Brothers Discovery warned that the strikes may affect the studio's ability to produce and deliver content. In its earnings call Thursday, talk of the strikes cast a pall on what was already a tough second quarter for the company. Warner Brothers' would-be summer blockbuster The Flash flopped, causing the studio to take a revenue hit, missing Wall Street estimates. And while its Barbie film is a big success, the company incurred significant costs marketing the movie. Barbie's July release means the studio won't reap potential box office rewards until the third quarter. Warner Brothers Discovery, which was forged by last year's union of Warner Media and Discovery, also reported that total global streaming subscribers for its HBO, Max and Discovery Plus services dropped by about 2 million from the end of the first quarter to 95.8 million subscribers. 
CEO David Zasloff, however, said that the streaming business is, quote, tracking well ahead of our financial projections, generating positive core earnings in the first half of 2023. Shares of Warner Brothers Discovery moved lower in Thursday trading. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. As the two nations repair strain tires, Australia welcomed China's move to drop anti-dumpling and anti-subsidy tariffs on Australian barley imports that have been in place for three years, affecting billions of dollars of trade. Nicholas Petro, the eldest son of Colombian President Gustavo Petro, could face home detention during an illegal money trial after the prosecutor said the defendant admitted illegal cash entered his father's election campaign last year. The ongoing Shagudu Universe Aid Games has seen five events shatter records as it reaches its midpoint. Chinese swimmers broke records in women's 4 into 100 meter freestyle relay, men's 100 meter breaststroke, women's 50 meter butterfly, and 4 into 100 meter medley relay. Whereas young athletes from India set new records for the men's 10 meter air rifle team event. The livelihoods of indigenous families living near Bolivia's Lake Titicaca continue to fall under threat as drought threatens locals who make a living largely from subsistence farming. Two U.S. Navy sailors have been arrested on charges related to allegedly spying for China. Both are accused of having passed along national defense information to Chinese intelligence officials. In return for cash payments. And that is all we have for you tonight on World News. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. We leave you tonight in Nigeria, where artist Shibuke Ilfiaduku weaves discarded pants into portraits. Thank you for watching. Have a great night. <laughs>